You've seen this map before. The edges are blue, the middle is red, and everyone is mad at Florida. But it hasn't always been that way. New parties have come and gone. New states expanded the map, then shifted from the left to right and back again. And who was allowed to vote has transformed this map over the last 231 years. Here's how the U.S. has voted in every presidential election since 1789. Thirteen years after the signing of the Declaration of Independence, George Washington is elected the first president of the Union in 1789. He easily wins a second term. But only about 1.3% of the country's population casts a ballot. In most states, only white men who own property can vote with some exceptions. Pennsylvania, Maryland, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Vermont, all allowed free people of color to vote on exactly the same basis as their white neighbors and without property requirements. The birth of our two-party system includes the Federalists, who favor financial interests, and the Democratic Republicans, who favor farmers. The election of Thomas Jefferson in 1800 initiates nearly 40 years of Democratic-Republican presidential dominance. In 1824, four Democratic Republicans run against each other in a race so close, it's decided by the House of Representatives, who chooses John Quincy Adams over Andrew Jackson. Four years later, Jackson runs again. By then, many states have eliminated property requirements and voter participation almost doubles. Jackson rallies white working class voters to fight Washington elitism. He wins in a landslide. And some of it is on the basis of economic populism. Some of it is on the basis of inveterate racist policies towards Native American nations. Some of it is on the basis of a kind of friendliness and accommodation to slavery. Jackson wins again in 1832, and a new business-friendly opposition party comes together. They call themselves the Whigs, and one of their major issues is fighting the expansion of slavery into new territories. Slavery is the one issue that is most likely to have determined which way someone votes throughout the first half of the 19th century, with conservatives and liberals on both sides. In 1836, four Whig candidates run, but Democratic Republican Martin Van Buren wins the most states. And power shifts back and forth between the two parties for the next decade. New states like Florida, Texas, and Iowa expand the electoral map. By 1856, after a string of defeats and infighting over slavery, the Whig Party collapses. A new Republican Party emerges, opposing slavery and calling for economic reform. So at this point, we have both major parties that exist today, even though their platforms have changed drastically since then. The Republicans gain popularity in the North and try to win over free black voters in the South. It's not as if Republicans are not racially discriminatory or they're not racist. It's gonna benefit them to have black people become a part of the franchise and begin to vote and ideally be Republicans. Meanwhile, the Democratic Party unifies the pro-slavery vote and cements their hold on the South. That divide deepens and in 1860, Republican Abraham Lincoln wins on an anti-slavery platform. It's really two separate elections, one in the North and one in the South. Lincoln isn't even on the ballot in most of the slave states. We might as well already be in two distinct republics by the summer and fall of 1860. Starting with South Carolina, 11 Southern states secede from the Union to form the Confederacy, and the Civil War begins in 1861. In the midst of the war, Lincoln wins a second term. That's also the first election where we had absentee balloting. Uh, Lincoln wanted to make it possible for soldiers in the field to vote because he assumed they would vote overwhelmingly Republican, which in fact is what they did. A year later, the Confederacy loses and Southern states begin to rejoin the Union. Lincoln is assassinated in 1865 and Vice President Andrew Johnson takes over. Republicans hang on to power when Ulysses S. Grant wins in 1868. Grant signs the 15th Amendment, giving all male citizens the right to vote, regardless of color or race with the exception of Native Americans. Grant wins again in 1872. And the only reason Grant won a popular majority was because there were sufficient numbers of blacks voting. In some Southern states, 90% of African Americans voted. In 1876, it wasn't clear which candidate won the election. So Congress makes a deal. Republicans get the presidency with Rutherford B. Hayes taking office. And Democrats in the South get something they've wanted since the end of the war 
the removal of federal troops that have been protecting the civil rights of newly freed black people. People can vote, people can run for office, they can purchase property, and essentially the Hayes-Tilden Compromise in 1877 ends Reconstruction, and we begin to move towards what we later come to know as Jim Crow. State and local governments pass laws designed to keep African Americans from voting. Democrats ride a wave of anti-Reconstruction sentiment and dominate the South for the next century or so. Still, in 1896, Republican William McKinley wins by the largest margin his party has seen in 20 years. The Republican Party basically had become the presumptive majority party. I mean, it was a contest basically over kind of rural agrarianism and urban capitalism, and the country favored Republicans. In 1912, Theodore Roosevelt runs as a progressive in what he dubs the Bull Moose Party. It splits the Republican vote in half, handing the win to Democrat Woodrow Wilson. Still, Roosevelt's Progressive Party is the first with an agenda designed to attract women suffragists. So the agenda of progressives was things like food and drug legislation, child labor legislation, uh, factory legislation, better education, uh, those sorts of things. And those are traditionally seen as women's issues. And the progressives understood that if they enfranchised women, they would win more votes. The women's movement gains momentum through the 1910s, and states like Washington, Oregon, and California give women the vote. The 19th Amendment grants women the right to vote nationwide in 1920, but six decades pass before they turn out at the same rate as men and form a significant voting bloc. Women maybe turned out at two thirds of male voters, right? They weren't changing the electorate in that way. They weren't gonna change it until they started voting differently from men. After Wilson, three Republicans win in a row, ending with Herbert Hoover in 1928. The economy crashes in 1929 and public outrage over the Great Depression helps Franklin D. Roosevelt win in 1932. World War II collides with the end of his second term and the nation decides to stick with him for an unprecedented third term and then a fourth term to get them through the other side of the war. Voter demographics and party alignment shift during his 12-year presidency in ways that can still be felt today. Democrats consolidate the support of recent immigrants and younger working-class whites who had previously voted Republican. New Deal Democrats begin winning over the millions of black people migrating north to escape Jim Crow terror in the South. When Roosevelt first ran in 1932, when he was first elected, 80% of African Americans were still voting for Herbert Hoover. The first time significant numbers of blacks voted Democratic was in Franklin Roosevelt's re-election in 1936, and that's because the New Deal anti-poverty programs extended to African Americans. FDR dies in 1945. Vice President Harry S. Truman takes over and then wins the election of 1948. If you were a Truman voter in 1948, what you thought you would be voting for is, in effect, a third stage of the New Deal. But in 1952, Republican Dwight D. Eisenhower ends 20 years of Democratic rule with two landslide elections in which he only loses the South. Presidential campaigning passes still another milestone. A TV-savvy campaign leads John F. Kennedy to victory in 1960, the last time a winning candidate loses Ohio. The newly popular medium forces him, and the nation, to confront rampant discrimination against black people. Civil rights activity um, in the 1960s is being aired on television globally. By the mid-1960s, we're involved in Vietnam. Parade, mass draft card burning was urged. The Globe is seeing us every day on television, um, not standing by the same kinds of principles that we argue we are bringing to other countries. And our path, our obligation, is to make that revolution, that change. Civil rights bills had been passed in 1957 and 1960, but neither fully enfranchised blacks in the South. At 125, the motorcade moves into the downtown area. Death is six minutes away. In JFK aware... is assassinated in late 1963. Lyndon B. Johnson becomes president and wins outright in 1964. If we succeed, it will not be because of what we have, but it will be because of what we are. He passes the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965, 
meant to keep states from changing voting laws the way they had during the Jim Crow era. You never actually achieve equity between the black vote in terms of its percentage share and the white vote, but the improvements are substantial. The Democrats' strong civil rights push alienates many white Southerners who throw their support behind Republicans. In 1968, a year of social upheaval, Republicans pick up support in the West and Midwest as the country shifts right. Richard Nixon wins the election, running on law and order. What Nixon is essentially telling people is that civil rights has gone too far. If you elect me, you know, I'll, I'll bring us back to a more stable, uh, stable system. Nixon wins in a landslide in 1972. Two years later, amid the Watergate scandal, Nixon becomes the only president to ever resign. Therefore, I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Then in 1976, Jimmy Carter secures the Democrats' last win for almost two decades. Actor turned governor Ronald Reagan beats Carter in 1980, revitalizing the conservative movement. This every four-year ceremony we accept as normal is nothing less than a miracle. It's hard to overstate how devastating a defeat um, the 1980 election was for, for the Democrats. Because if you compare 1980 to 1984, they actually get worse. Reagan's vice president, George H.W. Bush, wins in 1988 as the clear frontrunner with the promise to continue Reagan's policies. But in 1992, Bill Clinton, a Southern Democratic governor, revitalizes his party by successfully appealing to moderate voters. And Clinton is, uh, is elected on this platform of a kind of young, new Democrat. Al Gore is his running mate. The idea is that this will symbolize a new generation of, uh, of Democrats. In 2000, Republicans rally behind the younger George Bush, George W., then the governor of Texas. Al Gore wins the popular vote, but a controversial Supreme Court decision gives Bush Florida, handing him the election. In the wake of the 9-11 attacks, Bush wins again in 2004, coming close to rebuilding Reagan's Red Wall. But in 2008, during a devastating financial crisis, Democrat Barack Obama wins in a landslide, picking up solidly Republican states like Virginia and becomes the first black president. But on this January night, at this defining moment in history, you have done what the cynics said we couldn't do. The Obama approach is to energize the young and essentially to appease uh, and soothe suburban voters who had been uh, reliant Republican voters in the 80s and 90s because basically they thought Democrats would drive the country off the cliff uh, uh, economically. After Obama wins a second term in 2012 with the same diverse coalition of voters, Republicans do what they call an autopsy on their party. The postmortem said, we need to reach out to Latino voters. We need to reach out to Asian voters. But four years later, they nominate a famed real estate baron and reality TV star not known for appealing to a diverse array of voters. Donald Trump doesn't intend to build a wall. Believe me, folks, we're building the wall, believe me. And believe me. instead, what Trump realized was, maybe I could double down on the racially resentful white people who in each election are voting slightly more and more Republican. In 2016, Hillary Clinton is the odds-on favorite to become the first female president. Pundits point to the blue wall of states that had voted Democratic over the past six elections. But that was not to be. Very similar to the Voting Rights Act itself, the election of Obama created a significant backlash. I mean, the American history is defined to some degree by civil rights movement forward, backlash, white supremacy back. Clinton does win the popular vote, but Trump charges through the blue wall, winning the Electoral College with a campaign that by and large ignored the 2012 autopsy. Trump's populist campaign captures swing states like Florida, Pennsylvania, and Wisconsin that could have gone either way. I, I don't know if, if Trump's a political genius or not, but he intuited something that you actually could squeeze another presidential victory or two out of a racially disaffected white elector. Today, the experts say the American political system is the most polarized it's ever been. Trump benefited from the fact that 90% of Republicans are gonna support him. There's this phenomenon called negative partisanship, where even if you don't love your party, you know you hate the other side. 
Leading up to the 2020 election, a global pandemic and months of civil unrest have left the most diverse electorate in history firmly divided along party lines. Fully one-third of eligible voters are non-white, driven by an increase in the Hispanic population. But questions remain around whether people will make it to the polls, how states will handle mail-in votes, or when a winner can even be announced.